Our Father, we, we thank you for the privilege of walking with Jesus. Many of us uh, were raised in church, some not, but the vast majority of the people gathered here have had divine intervention. We were going on our own paths, our own plans, which are going to take us straight out of your presence for eternity. And yet you caused the blindness to fall from our eyes and we recognize Christ as precious because while we could do nothing to get to you, no way to merit your favor, you came to us. You lived the perfect life, Lord Jesus. You died the death that we each one deserved and you credit your own perfections, your own righteousness to us by faith. So Lord Jesus, grow us in greater and deeper and more consistent demonstrations of love for you and our obedience. Wrap us up in yourself this morning as we sit at your feet one more time and are amazed at our Savior. We're amazed at your revelation in Scripture who reveals you in all your glorious splendor and what you expect of us. Meet with your church for your praise and glory we ask. Amen. Nambana was an African prince who arrived in England from the Sierra Leone in 1791. He was given a Bible and told that it was the Word of God. When asked later how he was convinced that it was indeed the Word of God, Nambana replied, When I found all good men minding the Bible and calling it the Word of God and all bad men re disregarding it, I then was sure that the Bible must be what good men call it, the Word of God. Men who receive the Bible as the Word of God are transformed by its power. You might recall that famous verse where Paul reflects with the saints at Thessalonica. You yourselves, he says, know that our coming to you wasn't in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amidst much opposition. And amidst the opposition, as Paul proclaimed God's truth, they didn't receive this as a mere man. Paul records in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, this is why we constantly thank God that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. When we receive God's word, we are not only saved, but we begin getting sanctified. And so we want to wrap up the Gospel of Mark this morning with our study on Mark's abrupt and confusing end. So if you have turned to Mark 16, that's where we come again. We started chapter 16 last week with the resurrection account of the Lord Jesus, and the gals are at the empty tomb. Several of you have heard my testimony and know that I was raised in the church. My mother was the church pianist. My dad was an elder, and I was told that this is the Word of God. And yet in Bible college, as a young, ignorant believer, I was introduced to things that I never knew existed. So this is capital I, ignorance. Like the Fight and Fundamentalist Bible College I went to was King James only, even though they would not admit to it who think that God supernaturally preserved His Word in the 1611 King James Version. And then later, I was exposed to a whole lot of other stuff. To the fact that some Bible commentary, you got to be picky. You know, I had a, a professor in Bible college that would buy retired pastors' libraries or when churches are going defunct, he'd buy libraries and resell them. And I thought, this is, a, this is a great buy, a buck a commentary. This fits in a poor college student's budget real well. And then I had to learn that you need to discern because a lot of these commentaries, 
are written by those who don't even believe the Bible. They're commenting about the book they don't even believe in, including lots of dead liberal Germans. One of the articles I told you, a new one in the, uh, it was probably almost 20 years ago, I, uh, the first paper I wrote in seminary, was t uh, I titled it Derived Inspiration. We know the doctrine of inspiration. God claims to be the source of his own word. But this paper, this bound book, is not what the Apostle Paul wrote in, or John Mark, or Moses, or Isaiah. So how did it get from their hands to us so that we can still claim that we held the inspired and inerrant word? And so if you're interested in uh, an article that might take you a little more than one cup of coffee, maybe two cups, uh, they're in the foyer next to the bulletins. And I'll, uh, you know I love killing copiers. I'll, I'll print off more copies if, uh, if those uh, disappear. You know, there's issues like higher criticism that emerged in largely German academic circles. There's those that deny the, Bi the, the, the miracles, those saying the Bible's full of contradictions, that it's the word of man, not the word of God, as the uh, which is the opposite of the Thessalonians' reception. So who wrote the Bible, God or man? Good question, just nod your head, uh-huh. Yes, God wrote the Bible, but he used human instruments. God is the divine author, and so Scripture finds its source in the very mind of God. Paul would, would hold the Scriptures out to the Corinthians and say, you have the very mind of Christ in here. And yet that human instrument, as the Holy Spirit moved the prophets and moved the apostles to pen and deliver to man, that God inspired His Word. It finds its source in Him. And this is not the kind of inspiration like some of my family members. I've got a cousin who's a writer and people talk, writers talk about getting inspired and so they sit down and write a new novel. That's not the kind of inspiration we're talking about. I think I'd mentioned in the sermon last week when we looked at the first eight verses of Mark 16. I gave you a preview that the resurrection account ends the Gospel of Mark. So as we uh, figuratively scratch our heads, well, what do we do with the, the rest of the 11, uh, 12 verses? From verses 9 onward. When it comes to textual criticism or lower criticism, not like the liberal higher critics that want to uh, throw the Word of God out. Through textual criticism, we can figure out where there's issues with copies that have been made through the centuries which have crept in. Because God has used fallen, weak man. So the ending of the Gospel of Mark is front and center when we talk about variants in Scripture. And so it behooves us to exert a little mental exercise this morning because I think that this exposition will not only help us in the closure of the Gospel of Mark, but it will influence our daily devotions, even our public worship as we come together and handle the Word of God. It's virtually certain that verses 9 to 20 is a later addition and not the original ending of the Gospel of Mark. And the evidence for this judgment is complex. And as I was, uh, we were doing another teacher video last Sunday, and as I tell our teachers, we got to learn to, to teach the Word of God in an age-appropriate level. So when kids go up to Sunday school, it's not that they can't understand Bible exposition. They can. But in a more appropriate manner, our teachers are putting the cookie jar down on a, a lower shelf for our kids to uh, hear and understand at, at their level. And so I'm, we'll, we'll seek to not get into all the, the details. To say that verses 9 to 20 is not original, is to also remember that none of the autograph copies of the documents of the New Testament survives. The Greek text of the New Testament is 
constructed from later copies of manuscripts dating from A.D. 135 at the earliest to about A.D. 1200 at the latest. These copies, of which more than 5,000 exist, range in size from scraps a little larger than a postage stamp to complete manuscripts of the Bible. In general, these copies show a remarkable agreement among themselves. But the most notorious exception to this otherwise happy rule of agreement among all the manuscripts is Mark, which presents the gravest textual problem in the New Testament, and it's really not a problem as you walk with me through our message today. Now, the two oldest and most important manuscripts of the Bible are Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus who omit verses 9 to 20, as do several early translations of versions, including the old Latin, Sinaitic, Syriac manuscript, about a hundred Armenian manuscripts, and two oldest Georgian manuscripts. You look at early church fathers, what can we learn from church history? Well, Clement of Alexandria, nor origin shows any awareness of the existence of this longer ending that is in our English translations. Eusebius, Jerome, attest that 9 through 20 were absent from the majority of Greek copies of Mark that were known to them way back then. Beloved, would you allow this kind of wrap-up sermon to bolster your confidence in the Word of God and enliven your bold and faithful, though at sometimes difficult, service to Jesus. Like I said, it'll require a little mental lifting today, but it'll show great value in our daily study in private as well as our weekly public engagements with Scripture. Our starting point is a confirming conviction. If you're following along in the outline in the back of your bulletin, that's our first point. Confirming conviction. Even before reading the text, we come to the text with our convictions already set that God's Word finds its source in God, it's inspired, and it's inerrant, recorded without error. Upon these twin doctrines hangs all of Christianity. You realize that we could not know God nor what He expects of us if there's an issue with inerrancy or inspiration. There'd be no standard by which to measure everything as to whether it's right or whether it's wrong. There'd be no salvation, and especially no salvation of it with possible failing promises. If it can fail in one point, it can fail in a lot. So I asked you to turn to the Gospel of Mark, because that's where we're going to go, but a little Bible study before we get there. Second Timothy chapter 3. And even if you've memorized 2 Timothy 3.16, run over there with me and set your eyeballs on it. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16. 2 Timothy 3.16, you remember that First and Second Timothy and Titus are the pastoral epistles. Paul's writing to Timothy here. And he's reminding him all Scripture... Now, the New Testament hadn't been completed yet. He's referring to the Old Testament in specific here. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. All Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, all 66 books, and not just the books, the words, the sentences, the structures, all of it's inspired by God. It's a classic verse on the subject. The Bible finds its source in God alone. Yet God spoke and wrote through the prophets. Let's go back to where maybe some of your pages could still be sticking together. Back in 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 9. In verse 36, it's just one of many passages teaching us how God spoke and He wrote through the human 
instruments that he chose. Second Timoth uh, Second Kings 9.36, Therefore they returned and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, and then he goes on to say what, he, what the prophet had said. So who wrote the Bible? God or man? Uh-huh. God wrote it, but he used weaklings of men. Later on in chapter 14 of 2 Kings, 14.25. Halfway through the verse, we're told that he, capital H, speaking of God, spoke through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was at gath -Hever. Fast forward to the major prophets. We go to Jeremiah. Isaiah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 37. This is just reminders of which many of you have already learned. I know we're not treading new ground for several Jeremiah 37, verse 2. But neither he nor his servant nor the people of the land listened to the words of the Lord, which he spoke through Jeremiah the prophet. So we've seen Elijah, we've seen Jonah, we see Jeremiah. How about a minor prophet? Keep going to the, the 12 minor prophets. We've got Zechariah. Zechariah chapter chapter number 7 and verse 7. Are not these the words which the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and prospered along with all its cities around the Negev and the foothills inhabited? The words which the Lord proclaimed how? By the former prophets. Verse 12. They made their hearts like flint so that they could not hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. In 2 Tim uh, Second Tim Second Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 21, Peter talks about how that we have a more sure word of prophecy. Peter, you might recall, in the Gospel of Mark, was one of three men, three of the disciples that got to go up to the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw Jesus transfigured. He experienced it. And as he's penning Scripture, he says, we have a more sure word. What is that? It's the Bible. It's more sure than personal experience, which can be misinterpreted. And in, uh, in that passage in Second Peter, we're told how that the Spirit moved them along. That term moved is Pharaoh. The same verb used in the New Testament for when a ship would be pushed along, a sailboat would be passed, pushed along by a wind. And so the Spirit moved these men along so that what they wrote down was indeed the Word of God. So close was God's revelation to His apostles and His prophets that for them to speak or write was essentially Him. They're so intertwined. Back in Exodus 20, we have the Ten Words of God. The Ten Commandments. In what say, Exodus 20, verse 1, Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So for God to speak and Moses to speak was essentially the same act. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Back in Genesis chapter 12, when God meets with and promises blessing to Abraham, or in the New Testament, it attests to itself as being inspired. We read from 2 Timothy 3.16. In 2 Peter 3.16, Peter, 
places Paul's writings in the category of inspired scripture. And in refers to Paul's writings, Peter gently throws the Apostle Paul under the bus and he says some of the things that Paul says is hard to understand. That's a given. But it is still inspired writ. So our responsibility is to receive God's word not as the words of men, though they were faithful servants and tools in the hands of our sovereign God, but to receive them as the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, our first verse that we mentioned during the sermon. This is our confirming conviction. This is a foundational truth to affirm as we ask the question about the end of the Gospel of Mark. We must be settled on it. As settled as the old Baptist preacher Spurgeon. He said the misreadings of the copies are really so inconsiderable and are so happily corrected by other manuscripts that our Bible is a marvel in literature for the comparative ease with which to correct the text is discoverable, unquote. So the problem is really no problem. Let's move from our confirming conviction on the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture to this tantalizing tension in Mark. No other text of Scripture delivers this tension like Mark's ending. It's the, the front of the list, top of the list, when it comes to uh, variance, textual variance. You see, we want a neat, pretty package uh, tied up with a bow and not have any tensions and difficulties. But we have to be content to leave the tensions in Scripture, the mysteries, the sovereign secrets, the secret things belong to the Lord, Deuteronomy 29, 29. And though the Bible is clear, it's per perspicuous, there are difficulties that we must work through. And the Bible doesn't blush as we work through those issues. So allow me just a couple of moments to introduce to you textual criticism, help you savor a few of the gifts and the gifted ones that God has given to His church. Because I, for one, am so grateful for some of the training I've had the privilege to have and sound doctrine boning up on good theology along with getting training in the original languages of the Old Testament's Hebrew, the New Testament's Greek. And I understand the pecking order. I'm the dullest knife in the drawer in there. What about these biblical scholars that God has given to His church? Some of what I questioned in seminary was, uh, as I'm studying with these 4.0 students, is, God, where's the fairness? The whole brain trust is in some of these select guys. Uh, you know, when, when God said, said he was giving out brains, I saw it, thought he said trains, and I said, I'd take the next one. And uh, you know, we, we kind of wonder. But there, God raises up these brilliant men. He gifts them. He raises them up in college, Bible colleges and seminary training who've been greatly used in these intricate matters. And they have probably forgotten more than I'll ever, ever know. English Baptist pastor, biblical scholar and theologian, John Gill. As he's addressing inspiration and we understand the original autographs were inspired by God and to the extent that our contemporary translations represent those, we've got the inspired Word of God. And so he said, this inspiration is to be understood of the Scriptures as in the original languages in which they were written and not of translations. Unless it could be thought that the translators of the Bible into the several languages of the nations into which it has been translated were under the divine inspiration also in translating and were directed of God to the use of words they've rendered the original by. But this is not reasonable to suppose. Only the original exemplar is authentic and not translations and transcriptions and copies of them, though ever so perfect. And to the Bible, in its original languages, is every translation to be brought, and by it to be examined, and tried, and judged, and to be corrected and amended, 
And if this was not the case, we should have had no certain and infallible rule to go by. So when we're doing the hard work of textual criticism with the mass amount of manuscripts that have been copied and copied and copied, I said the Bible doesn't blush as we do our work and examine it. Gill goes on to say, here I cannot but observe the amazing ignorance and stupidity of some persons who take it into their heads to decry learning and learned men. For what would they have done for a Bible had it not been for them as instruments? Bless God, therefore, and be thankful that God has in His providence raised up such men to translate the Bible into the mother tongue of every nation and particularly into ours. And that He still continues to raise up such who are able to defend the translation made against erroneous persons and enemies of the truth and to correct and amend it in lesser matters in which it may be failed and clear and illustrated by their learned notes upon it. Praise God for the translators. I got a buddy who just left to go to Africa to translate the scriptures in the language of people. Though I'm doing my own work of translation to put together something that's going into going to be scripted, uh-uh. No way, Jose. Praise God for the Old Testament scholars. Praise God for New Testament scholars. Are you aware that it's only been the past few hundred years that believers have had complete copies of scripture? It's new. And though there have been portions of the Gospel of John and the Psalter, they've all been copies, no originals. These copies of copies are handwritten well into the 16th and 17th centuries. Now, I still use a lot of pads of paper and a lot of pens, and I've got the calluses to prove it. Even in this day of computer, I use paper notes. So we've got to kind of step back and think through and thank God for the laborious work of hand copying. Various variants entered into the transmission. In textual criticism, we determine what non-originals have crept in. You know, there's very clearly recognizable variants as you compare the documents. You know, a copyist could misspell a word. When my editor and I were working on my doctoral dissertation ten, over 10 years ago, we we're trying to get all the misspellings and the bad punctuation and all the stuff because once that thing got bound, it's gonna, my errors would be entombed in this book. No thank you. And yet humility affirms that when God condescended to use man, his, man's weaknesses are going to enter into what he does for God. You, know, you can misspell a word or skip a phrase or a line or as they were hearing verbal dictation constantly as somebody was, was speaking the word for copyists to write down. Are you saying here H-E-R-E or H-E-A-R? Going to be issues. That verbal dictation was used a lot in copying. Or even harmonizing a text that he had written earlier. Have I already written this down? Let me consult my notes and see if I'd already done this. The one particular thing that scholars have been careful of is to discern the marginal notes. Or you might call them commentaries. And prayers and songbooks from the actual text. You've probably heard me say, whether it's when I'm preaching or when I'm teaching, Maybe you've got your virgin Bible that's got no marks in it. Then buy yourself a cheap Bible that you'll write in. Take notes. I encourage people all the time with, with books. I, all my commentaries are written in. I've, I've messed up my commentaries because it's, a, it's right there. One-stop shopping. This is what men and women have done through the centuries. So in the transmission of Scripture, as we're thinking from the mind of God to what we hold in our hands. So at first, the God's Word first existed in His mind. And then He communicated it to the mind of His writers. 
Thirdly, through the Holy Spirit's movement of the writer's thoughts using language structures and types and symbols, using Hebrew and Greek nuances to really convey meaning in the text. It was as it's translated into the language of the people and copied where these expected variants come from. And Mark, as I said, is at the top of the list with this long ending, an additional 12 verses that have been, you know, there have been other occasions in the Gospel of Mark that I haven't introduced you to some of the variants in, uh, in Mark, but you've got to deal with the ending. No ancient book has been better preserved through the centuries than the Bible. Consider by comparison ancient Greek historian and geographer Herodotus, who wrote the histories, of which only eight manuscripts have survived, the oldest dating to approximately 1,300 years after the original. So here you've got a real historian, Herodotus. And the closest manuscript we've got to his original is 1,300 years after he originally wrote it. Only eight of those manuscripts survive. You know, this, uh, his histories is considered the, found, uh, the foundational work of history in our Western literature. How about Julius Caesar's Gaelic Wars? There's a mere ten manuscript copies that have been discovered and the earliest of which is a thousand years removed from its author. A thousand years after Julius Caesar wrote it. There are likewise only eight surviving manuscripts of the history of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides, all of them dating more than 13 centuries after the original. I could give you example after example if I wanted to bore you to tears today. Providing from the writings of Aristotle to Tacitus. All of this just to say that when it comes to the preservation of ancient manuscripts of the Bible, no other text even comes close to the writings of Scripture. F.F. Bruce, renowned Old Testament, uh, renowned scholar, says there is no body of ancient literature in the world which enjoys such a wealth of good textual attestation as our New Testaments do. In contrast to hardly any manuscripts to all these other historical documents, the ancient Greek manuscripts of our New Testament number more than 5,000. So we move from 8 or 10 to 5,000. Ranging from small fragments of papyri to complete codices containing all 27 books. And a few of those manuscripts are only 25 to 50 years removed from the original autographs that were originally written. Here we could continue to go on by mentioning the Antinicene church fathers whose writings contain some 32,000 citations and allusions to the New Testament. These are those who were acquainted with the apostles who faded off the scene. You know, you could read up a little more on that from Josh McDowell's New Evidence That Demands a Verdict, and I use that example in specific because I know many of you have copies of it. You know, as we think about our, our confidence and we deal with this, this tension, a man who has preached the Bible for 53 years and never denied it. John MacArthur put it this way, in his sovereign providence, the Spirit of God preserved a myriad of ancient witnesses to the biblical text so that after two millennia, believers can rest assured in the trustworthiness of their copies of Scripture. Like I said earlier about copies of copies, we're not surprised on the textual variants because of the human element. Before the invention of the printing press, which is around 1450, biblical manuscripts were copied entirely by hand resulting in scribal errors. You know, when I'm sitting there typing and I've got my uh, book magnet holding the pages open of a book and I'm, I'm copying, I find myself either further down the line or repeating what I've already typed up. 
you know, if there was, if there was questions, they, they might put that question, uh, is this original or is this not? And they put it in the margins. And eventually some of those notes got into the, the body of the text. Because once you throw it away, it's gone for good. I write the first rough draft of my sermon Friday morning and then I'm blue penning it all day Friday and the rest of Saturday printing off another copy for in the pulpit. And before I'll throw away an original draft, I'm making sure I've typed up all my corrections. And you miss some. But since so many manuscripts have survived, biblical scholars are able to determine the original text with an extremely high degree of accuracy. When we're going to our Greek New Testament and we're following along and translating Mark's Gospel and we're looking down below the page at the document, which, which documents give emphasis for the reality and the originality of some of the words. You can go there and do that. Summarizing all that external evidence, William Lane explains, he says, to the witness of the two earliest parchment codices, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, might be added other minuscule documents, the absence of verses 9 to 20 of Mark 6, 16, and the old Latin manuscript. There's a wide range of support for the originality of that abrupt ending. You chop it off at verse 8, which is original, it is abrupt, but it's not incomplete, and yet additions have been made to try to smooth that roughness out. Like I said, if, if uh, copyists were unsure, they'd write in the margins, because once you dispose of it, it's gone forever. And yet God has graciously and providentially preserved His Word. Dr. Wayne Grudem said, for, the most, for most practical purposes, then, the current published scholarly texts of the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament are the same as the original manuscripts. Thus, when we say the original manuscripts were inerrant, we're also implying that over 99% of the words in our present manuscripts are also inerrant, for they're exact copies of the originals. Furthermore, we know where the uncertain readings are, so we can go and look them up. Thus, our present manuscripts are, for most purposes, the same as the manuscripts, and the doctrine of inerrancy, therefore, directly concerns our present manuscripts as well. So we've got a confirming conviction on the inerrancy and inspiration of Scripture. We've got this tantalizing tension at the end of Mark 16. How about a rehashing of Revelation is what those verses are. Though not inspired, I wouldn't teach the long ending like the rest of God breathed Scripture. Each, is ta each of these verses is covered elsewhere, mostly in the Gospel, some in Acts. Read the verses with me if you would. Mark 16, verse 9. The American Standard Bible has a bracket right here telling us that this is not original. Now, after he had risen, early on the first day of the week, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene. Well, we already knew that because we studied the first eight verses, right? From whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. After that, he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along on their way to the country. They went away and reported it to the others, but they did not believe them either. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. So he said to them, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they'll cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Notice verse 18. They'll, they'll pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will not recover. 
and I'll behave myself and spare you the agony of going through how this, these, this verse has been tortured and uh, people have suffered from it. Verse 19, So then when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. Think again of the human authors of Scripture and that they would write in the margins. We don't know who the scribe or scribes were who inserted verses 9 to 20. Doesn't really matter. Eusebius of Caesarea, back in 265 to 340, is the first Christian writer to express doubts concerning this long ending. He remarked, quote, nearly all the copies of the gospel according to Mark end with verse 8. Jerome, writing from Bethlehem a century later, from 406 to 407, made almost the same statement as Eusebius. Go another century to Victor of Antioch in the 5th century. He's the first known commentator on Mark, and he just repeated Eusebius' conclusion. So there's all this external evidence, but it's also confirmed by internal evidence. As you're reading through these verses, they are not marking. It doesn't sound like Mark that we've been through nearly 16 chapters studying. One of the great Greek scholars that God had gifted his church with, Dr. Hort, summarizes this unfavorable evidence. He says, quote, it does not join to the end of verse 8, the change of subject being extremely abrupt. The style is wholly unlike Mark. We have here not a narrative, but a summary or epitome of events after the resurrection covering in a few lines a considerable period. And the writer shows a strong desire to point a moral, which is not in the least characteristic of Mark. Everett Harrison in his New Testament introduction book agrees saying it's easy to see that there was a felt need for supplementation. A felt need for supplementation. Mark can't cut it off here. He's got more to say. No, not necessarily. B.B. Warfield, the great Princeton divine, staunch conservative, Likewise concludes, quote, the combined force of both external and internal evidence excludes this section from a place in Mark's gospel quite independently of the critic's ability to count for the unfinished look of Mark's gospel as it is left or for the origin of the section itself. Though we may be uncomfortable, the abruptness remains. The reason why I titled this Rehashing Revelation is because as you go down through these verses, you can find this teaching anywhere. You're not going to say you, you preach through these verses. You're not going to be doing rank heresy. There are at least three parts to this long ending. The first presents a summary account of the resurrection appearances. Verses 9 to 14 is the first section. The first Resurrection appearance is Mary Magdalene and then two travelers. Verses 15 to 18 is the, the next section. It records the commission of Christ to his followers. And then verses 19 and 20 closes with his ascension and the preaching of the gospel. So what's the result of this long ending? It's kind of a, a concise patchwork drawn from various New Testament texts, especially the other gospels. It's a a rehashing of other revelation that's already been given. So why not go to the authoritative texts that teach those as original? And the purpose for Mark doing this, says some, is that the longer ending, or, or why uh, some copyists did this, is constructed around the theme of calling the disciples from unbelief. Notice what we see here in this chapter like verse 11. When they heard that he was alive and been seen by her, 
What'd they do? They refused to believe it. Refused to believe it. Verse 13. They went away, reporting it to others. They didn't believe them either. Verse 14. After he appeared to the eleven themselves, as they reclined at the table, he reproached them. He corrected them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. So this is added in calling from unbelief to belief. Notice verse 16. He who has believed, has been baptized, shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believed. This kind of parallels the calling of Thomas from unbelief to belief. Keep your finger here since we're wrapping up the Gospel of Mark. Go over to John's Gospel real quick in John 20. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 20, to familiarize ourselves with this movement of unbelief to belief with Thomas. Who, who, who was Thomas dubbed as? Doubting Thomas. John 20, verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We've seen the Lord. He said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, put my finger in the place of the nails, put my hand into his side, I'll not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came and doors having been shut and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Because you've seen me, you believe, or have you believed? Blessed are they who did see and yet believe. You think about the first witnesses. There's no denying the grave clothes, the, the napkin that was around his face folded right there, and the angel saying, look, here's where you saw him rested on Friday night. No denying that. Well, when these earlier witnesses tell some of the other disciples, like Thomas, no. And it's days later. He could have spared himself a lot of pain and agony and depression of soul if he just believed. Well, that suggestion about why some have included the longer ending back here in Mark 16 to kind of smooth it out and that it's used in moving disciples from unbelief to belief, it's not too far off. Where does Mark cut it off? He concludes with the first witnesses fleeing the tomb because trembling and astonishment had gripped them. They said nothing to anyone, even though they were told to be witnesses, because they were afraid. You got trembling, traumas meaning that they were physically shaking from the angel's news in verses 6 and 7. It's traumatic. They're astonished. Astonishment gripped them. Ecstasis is an effect where we get our word ecstasy. They're basically in a trance. Talk about out-of-body experiences. This is, we can't handle this. Trembling, astonishment. And they were stunned to silence and saying nothing to anyone. And Mark leaves us with that verb, phobeo. They're afraid. And he ends his gospel account. You know, Mark's gospel ending may be abrupt, but it's not incomplete. Exactly the way it's intended to be. It needs no additives, no smoothing out, no finishing effect. Now let's remember what we established as we embarked in our study of the Gospel of Mark. Who's Mark writing to? He's writing to the saints who are suffering persecution in Rome. I think they knew a fair bit about fear and what the underground church in various countries of our present world go through. 
At the outset of God's great work, humans frequently recoil in fear. They are what? Us. The command, do not be afraid, reverberates throughout Scripture. We need to hear those words again and again because God's always doing what is unexpected and leading people to where they least want to go. Beginning from the time that God established a covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15, God had grand plans for Abraham's seed. He continues on to tell Jacob not to be afraid to go down to Egypt. He has grand plans to make a great nation. They're not a nation going down into Egypt, and God made a great and huge people coming out in the Exodus. And they do, coming out of the Exodus, what they were told not to do and going down in there. Don't be afraid. Isaiah. God promises that the enemies will vanish. He says, do not fear, I will help you, Isaiah 41.13. Fear not, for I have redeemed you, Isaiah 43.2. You get to the New Testament. Has the message changed? Peter writes his first epistle. 1 Peter 3.13. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? It's one of those questions that doesn't need to be answered. The understood answer is no one. How about Mark's audience? First century. The answer in the first century would, would be plenty. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Lots of people. They find out where we're meeting, they're going to kill us. Enemies were everywhere. Their threats naturally elicited fear and inhibited witness. Just like those first gals, they get to the tomb, they're told to go and be witnesses, and they're silent because they're fearful. The kinds of people who kill Jesus are still out there. They're ready to kill his followers. They can no longer get to Jesus, and the reproaches meant for him, Peter says, fall on us. We don't enjoy being hated or hunted down. It's safer to be quiet, to treasure all these things in our hearts rather than to bear our hearts to others. One might understand why those facing the persecution might be reticent to speak. But what excuse do those who enjoy all the comforts of life and freedom of worship? Throughout his gospel, Mark consistently punctuated key events in the life of Jesus by emphasizing the wonder that he evoked in the hearts and the minds of others. Amazement. He simply moves from one point of amazement about Christ to another. So the narrative ends right where it ought to end. It climaxes with amazement and bewilderment at the resurrection of the crucified Savior. In so doing, it leaves the reader in a place of wonder, awe, and worship centered on its glorious subject, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So, Doubting Thomas waited eight days for Jesus to appear to him if he just believed in the first place the witnesses. We suggested in the message last week that the gals should not have shown up at the tomb wringing their hands, who's going to move the stone away? Jesus already promised them, I'm going to meet you in Galilee. That's where they should have shown up. So just taking Christ at his word. And so should be filled with faith in his promises, not fear all around us. Would you pray with me? Our Lord and our God, when we come to the end of a book that we've been studying for a long time, it's uh, bittersweet. Whatever text we're in is our favorite text to study because God is speaking to his church. And so, Lord, ready us for our next venture. Help us to seal these truths in the Gospel of Mark to our heart as we have been amazed week in and week out. Our, our worship has been fueled. Our witness has been readied. Draw, elicit out of our hearts a greater gratitude and a, a, a more real love in our lives as disciples of Jesus.
Help us to open wide our lips in faith, not in fear. For we know the risen Savior, that because he rose, we will too through faith in his name. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and Lord. Amen.